camping a few years back when a fairly large storm hit overnight. And, and the tents and camping gear were all fine, but what we found the next day when we went for a drive through the bush was that some of the dirt tracks had been blocked from branches that had fallen down. Now, typically, we kind of just simply turn around and, and find a different way. But there was a particular beach that we were trying to get to. And so myself and, and some of our boys, we had to get out and kind of physically move the branches, which, which wasn't easy because a couple of them were large and so laying down the ground quite heavy. But we, we, you know, we managed to move them far enough so that we were you know, able to get past and, and really kind of have a great day at the beach. So today we, we come to the final chapter of Zechariah 14, which, um, as we'll see over the rest of this week, focuses on the day of the Lord, the day in which God both judges the enemy and saves his people. And what we'll see today especially is that just like some of us kind of making a path for our bus to get through, so too God makes a path for his people to escape from the coming judgment. Um, Zechariah 14 verse 1. Look, a day belonging to the Lord is coming when the plunder taken from you will be divided in your presence. I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem for battle. The city will be captured, the houses looted, the women raped. Half the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be removed from that city. And there is a sense where Zechariah could be taking us back prior to the exile when the Babylonians came and you know destroyed the temple. And indeed, half the people were, were originally carried off into Babylon, while half the people of God remained. And although the events described here are not dissimilar to what happened in the defeat of Israel, Zechariah seems to be pointing us to an event that hasn't happened yet. An event that may well be the final day of life, as at least as we know it. And, and I say that because, uh, as we'll see kind of in a moment, unlike the events of 586 BC when you know, the remaining half of God's people were eventually taken into exile, here the remaining half of God's people are saved. Um, Zechariah 14 verse 3. Then the Lord will go out to fight against those nations as he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives will be split in half from east to west, forming a huge valley, so that half the mountain will move to the north and half to the south. You will flee by my mountain valley, for the valley of the mountains will extend to Azal. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. Uh, the Mount of Olives stands to the east of Jerusalem, separated from the city by the Kidron Valley. And so when you stand on the Mount of Olives and look over the city of Jerusalem, you get a sense of how high you are and how high the city itself stands. And so the idea that the Mount of Olives would be torn in two is an event so momentous that it's kind of reminiscent of the parting of the Red Sea. And just like the parting of the Red Sea, the splitting of the Mount of Olives also allows the people of God to flee from their enemy. Notice, however, that the Lord God does not simply provide an escape for his people, but he himself comes with his holy ones, his angelic army, to deal with the nations around them. Now, friends, we're only at the beginning of what Zechariah describes as the day of the Lord. However, I wonder if you can take a moment to consider why the day of the Lord is described as both a glorious and horrible day. And then spend a couple of minutes in prayer praying for those you know who don't know Jesus. The world's good.